Hello class, Professor Dwight Hughes here for the Clark College in Tech 223 Scaling Networks course. This is Chapter 2, LAN Redundancy. We're going to take a look at spanning tree, which is the primary way we provide redundancy at layer 2 with our switching fabric while avoiding loops. We'll look at the varieties of spanning tree protocols. It's a protocol that's been around for a while, so there's five or six different varieties, some proprietary, some open source. We'll look at configuring spanning tree, and then we'll talk about first hop redundancy protocols, which is um, having more than one gateway router. A lot of objectives we'll cover. Let's get started. Redundancy at the OSI layers one and two, the switch layers. Multiple cable paths between switches provides physical redundancy in a switch network. This improves reliability in case a port goes down or a cable falls out. It ensures users have access to network resources despite path disruption. However, when you add additional routes between your switches, switches are not routers and they don't route, so they are unable to make best path decisions. They need to predetermine one and only one path through the switching fabric. So we need something, which we'll talk about next slide, which is spanning tree. But if we didn't have spanning tree, we could have MAC address table instability. We could have broadcast storms where a broadcast um, frame takes all available ports. It floods through the switch. And then each port it comes to, it floods out all ports on that device. And so if you were to run a broadcast, you would see that the packets increase and increase and increase until they bring the network to its knees. Also, you would have multiple frame transmissions where the frame gets duplicated unnecessarily on each redundant path. And the end device would receive two or three or five or seven copies of the same frame. Not such a big deal, except it does waste our bandwidth. So we'll look at each of these. MAC database instability. This is where the database is constantly updating. As the source MAC address seems to change from one port to another, as a frame comes in one port, goes out to the other switch, circles back around the other cable coming back into the original switch, but appears to come from a different port. And so the MAC address database is only capable of keeping track of one MAC address on one port. You can't have the same MAC address on two ports. So the switch constantly changes it. And if it has to do too many of those changes, it'll cause the switch to basically uh, freeze up. Broadcast storms. We talked a little about this. The network will fail, the switches will freeze up once they get too many frames for them to handle. We can create an infinite number of frames with broadcasts because broadcasts duplicate themselves um, based on the number of ports. So a 24 port switch, when you have one broadcast come in one port, it duplicates itself 23 times out the other ports. So you can imagine if you have two or more switches connected in a loop, this duplication um, exponentially occurs over and over. You have some nice animations in your online curriculum that illustrate these issues. Duplicate frames make sense. It would get sent out the uh, duplicated or um, redundant links in a loop topology. So you can end up with multiple frames arriving, but not all at the same time at different times. And this is going to cause some issues in terms of slowing down your devices as they deal with these extra copies, eventually they generally are able to get rid of them. Again, it's another uh, animation that you would have in your online curriculum. Spanning tree algorithm. STP ensures that there is only one logical path to all destinations. So although you're free to cable as many physically redundant paths, STP generates a logical path across one physical path and disables all others. So it ensures there's only one path through the network. A port is considered blocked when user data is prevented from entering or leaving that port. And that's what STP does with ports that 
are not part of the designated path. All additional redundant ports are blocked. The switches send what's called a BPDU, which is a special hello there frame that the STP protocol uses between switches to determine what ports to block and um, how to get through the network, what path is the best and that kind of thing. If the path is ever needed to compensate for a network cable or failure, STP will recalculate its paths and unblock ports as necessary to um, become active throughout the network again. A fantastic protocol. It saved a very serious problem we used to have with hubs. Before we had switches, we had hubs, and you just had to live with loops uh, and duplicate frames and uh, broadcast storms and all the other issues. So back when we had hubs, it was far more critical to add more routers into the network, and we used to um, split up our hubs with more routers. Today, the switches can stand on their own quite a bit using the spanning tree algorithm. Here's an example of its operation. If you had two or two redundant spanning tree trunks, here's two trunk ports coming out of switch two. Switch two then you can see can create a loop with itself through switch one and switch three. So to prevent the loop, switch two has blocked FA02. So fast ethernet port two on switch two is blocking. All other ports are active. By breaking the loop in this way, there is only one path through the network. STP uses port roles during its uh, setup process. It identifies each port and assigns it a role. It's either a root port. A root port is a port that points towards the root bridge. The root bridge is just a switch that's been elected to be the root of the diagram. It creates a tree diagram similar to a directory diagram where you might have a C drive and then you have subfolders under that. You have a root bridge and all other bridges tuck in under that. So the root bridge is the top of the hierarchy of the switching fabric and it's just determined by an election process that we'll be looking at. Once it's determined, then the ports are assigned roles. A root port is the port that points towards the root bridge with the best path to reach it. So on switch two, FA01 is the root port, where on switch three, FA01 is the root port. Notice it's not using the less desirable FA02 port because that would be a longer path to reach the root bridge. Once you've figured out your root ports, the switch then tries to figure out designated ports. Those are the ports that will be involved in switch forwarding. So they will be forwarding the frames to the adjacent switches. Once those are figured out, one of those or more have to be blocked and that would be called a non-designated port. So one or more of the ports needs to transition from designated to non-designated. To do this, switch two and switch three have to negotiate on which of their ports will remain designated and which will become non-designated. And they have a, a little routine they go through to make that determination we'll look at. Okay, let's talk first about the root bridge. That's the very first thing the switches do when they are powered on, is they meet the other switches through what's called a BPDU. And they send these BPDUs to their neighbor switches saying, hey, here's my bridge ID. So their bridge ID, um, they have a priority number and a MAC address, and also optionally a VLAN number. That information is sent to all their neighbors. Whoever has the lowest priority number wins the election and becomes the root bridge. If there's a tie, by default, all the switches are 32769, so they will have a tie. Everyone will have the same priority number. The tiebreaker would be the lowest MAC address. So the lowest MAC address would win the election in case of a tie with the priority number. So the priority number can be changed by you, the human. You can go into a switch and lower its priority number, ensuring that it wins the election and becomes the root bridge. And that's what you're seeing in the illustration on the left of this slide is there's the bridge priority number, the extended system ID is the VLAN, and then the MAC address. 
this case, we're assuming VLAN 1. Okay, now that we've elected a root bridge, we have to determine a best path cost so that we can choose our root port. This is only applicable to switch three and switch two. Switch one can just kick back. Switch one has won the election and is the root bridge. Root bridges don't have root ports because root ports point towards the root bridge. But switch two and switch three will both have to elect a root port. They can only have one, and so they have to look at all their ports and figure out which one has a best path to the root bridge. They look at the speed of the port. So you can see in the reference diagram on the left, they're going to look at a metric or cost value assigned based on the speed of the port. Now there was a little problem developed. If you look at the cost metric for the previous specification, it topped out at one gigabit. This created an issue when we got to 10 gigabit because one gigabit and 10 gigabit would be seen as the same cost. So they had to revise that. So the new updated specification changes those costs slightly to allow a 10 gigabit link to win out over a one gigabit link. So for instance, in the diagram you see if path um, two were 10 gigabit links and path one was one gigabit, path two would win because it has a better metric. Anyhow, that's not what we have. We have all the links the same. They're all fast ethernet, so they are sitting at a metric of 19. So you simply just count the, the shortest um, path here, which would be path one. You can look at all this information. This is just taking a look in your Wireshark software and it can go through and take a look at frames as they're coming. This is a BPDU caught right off the wire of a switch. You can just plug a PC running Wireshark into any port on the switch and pick up these BPDUs. They're being sent out about every 10 seconds. Okay. This is just showing that before the root bridge is elected, each switch assumes they will win. Here we have three root bridges. Each switch is saying, I'm the root bridge. If you look carefully, you'll see that the bridge ID and the root ID are the same. They match on switch three and switch one's bridge ID matches the root ID because each switch is vying to win the root bridge election. But once they exchange the BPDUs, they're going to notice that switch one has a lower bridge ID. And they will then start sending BPDUs that advertise the root ID as being switch one. And you'll see that starting to happen here. Extended system ID. So spanning tree predates VLAN. We had spanning tree many years before VLANs came around. So now that we have VLANs and pretty much everybody uses VLANs, they had to modify spanning tree to add a new field to accommodate the VLAN number. This is necessary so that we can do spanning tree on each VLAN. We'll get to that in a little bit, but you can choose to use spanning tree per switch where there's one root bridge, for your whole network, one physical switch that's the root bridge. Or you could have a spanning tree election on each VLAN. That's right, you could have a different root bridge for VLAN 1 than you have for VLAN 2 and VLAN 3. By default, again, the bridge priority number is always 32768 plus 1. The 1 is the VLAN ID. So we're assuming VLAN 1 here. So it's going to show is 32769. The default bridge priority for an exam is 32768. It's 32769 when the VLAN uh, is added, which remember is the extended system ID. You take the priority number 32768 and add the VLAN 1, and that's where you come up with 32769. Let's look at the varieties of spanning tree. Wow, there's a lot of them. We're just going to touch on these. These are the most prevalent. We have what we would call original STP. It's got IEEE number, number 8021D. 
Notice they had to add the year, 1998, because in their infinite wisdom, the IEEE assigned the replacement for that the same number, 8021D. So they just added the year at the end. So IEEE 8021D 2004 replaces IEEE 8021D 1998. Then we have PVST Plus, which is Cisco proprietary, and some others. Let's take a look. You can see a quick overview. This is right out of your online curriculum. You can see that several of these are Cisco proprietary, PVST Plus and Rapid PVST Plus. Those are both Cisco proprietary. The MSTP is Cisco and industry standard. They, 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 it's compatible. And the other two are industry standard, 8021D and 8021W. Let's take a look at Cisco's proprietary PVST Plus. This is the default form or um, variety of STP running on your switches. So if you take a look at Spanning Tree, so if you type show Spanning Tree Summary, you would see that PVST Plus is what's running on your switch. All of your switches need to run um, the same version of Spanning Tree, and if they cannot, all versions are backwards compatible with the original um, IEEE 8021D spanning tree. Okay, PVST Plus stands literally for per VLAN spanning tree, meaning the original spanning tree elected one root bridge and it was just a physical um, switch on your network. With the PVST Plus, you elect a root bridge for each VLAN. That could be the same physical switch. It could be different ones. It holds an election for each VLAN. The idea would be with PVST Plus that some parts of your network may not participate in all VLANs. So why have a root bridge for a VLAN that isn't even running in some part of the network? It would be more efficient to have that VLAN rooted over on a switch in an area of the network actually running that VLAN. So this is for larger, more complex networks that would have a lot of different VLANs, not all of them encompassing all of the company. One spanning tree instance for each VLAN maintained can mean a lot of CPU. It has to have an election and decide all those things we just talked about in the last section for each VLAN. It has to send BPDUs for each VLAN. So there's substantially more CPU overhead. Here's an example then where you have two different root bridges. You have switch one, the root bridge for VLAN 10, and you have switch three, the root bridge for VLAN 20. So Switch 2 down there is going to have two different root ports. It's going to have a VLAN 20 root port of F03, and it's going to have a VLAN 10 root port of F02. Okay, let's talk about port states and how PVST Plus operates. Since this is the predominant version of STP you will be using on the Cisco equipment. It always starts in a blocking state. So all ports, when the switch powers on and begins to do STP, all it does is process BPDU. So it listens, it's in a blocking state. Notice all it's doing is listening to BPDUs. It then moves to a listening state where again, it's doing the same thing. It's just receiving BPDUs. Eventually it goes to a learning state where it's actually learning who its neighbors is. It's starting to add MAC addresses to its um, MAC address forwarding table and it's still receiving those BPDUs. And then it transitions to a forwarding state where assuming that the ports um, are designated ports, they will turn on or a root port will turn on and they will start forwarding frames. If it's a non-designated port, it will stay in a blocking state. So non-designated ports are always in the blocking state and all other ports, those would be the designated and the root ports are in a forwarding state. The disabled state's kind of a misnomer. The STP process can't actually put a port in the disabled state. You do that by typing shutdown on the port. So when a port, when you type shutdown on a port, it enters the STP disabled state because the port's shut down. 
Extended System ID and PVST Plus Operation. So we talked earlier about that VLAN ID. So you can see that if you were doing VLAN 20, the bridge ID would be 32770. Right, because you'd take the default bridge priority of 32768 and add two, which is for VLAN 2. So it'd be 32770, that, that's just as simple as it is. Let's move on to Rapid PVST Plus, another Cisco proprietary switching protocol. The idea obviously with Rapid is to be faster than PVST Plus. So Rapid is able to converge quicker. It holds its elections faster. It still runs on each VLAN separately, so it's still per VLAN. It still has high CPU utilization, but it accomplishes its job quicker. So it does this, there's no blocking ports. It reduces the port states from five to three. You only have discarding, learning, or forwarding, and it moves through those then quicker, so it's able to get to a forwarding state more rapidly. So your ports change their name slightly. You have root ports still, you have designated ports, but we no longer have the non-designated. They're now called alternate ports. So an alternate port is a port that in uh, PVST would be called non-designated. This is a look at the BPDU. These are the fields in the BPDU, so it has all the fields listed in the field table there. That's what's in the message. And so you can see the types of things that the message carries quite a bit of information. Let's talk about edge ports. Edge ports are ports that you manually configure. And they're ports that you decide are not going to participate in spanning tree, and they're going to immediately go to forwarding. Boy, this is going to make your life a lot easier in the lab. You know when you plug a PC into a switch, the port goes amber for 50 seconds? You can watch that happen, even in Packet Tracer. Cable a switch to a PC, and the port lights go amber, similar to what you see in this diagram. If you configure those ports to be edge ports, they go green immediately. They don't bother to test for root bridge. They don't bother to go through any of the elections. You're certifying to the switch that that port is not going to be connected to another switch. That it in fact connects to an end device, like a printer, a PC, something else. So it's a simple command. You just type spanning tree port fast. Just go in the port like interface FA02 and type spanning tree port fast. And it will give you a, a whole paragraph of warning message that says, warning, this could cause loops and other bad stuff. Please make sure that there's no switch connected to this port. I like to add another command. Um, if I make a port in edge port, I like to add BPDU guard. So I type spanning tree BPDU guard, which allows spanning tree edge to work, but if it ever sees a BPDU, it shuts the port down. That way I don't have to worry about the loops. I think it would be good to get in the habit of typing that also when you create an edge port. Let's talk about configuring spanning tree. This is just looking at the default configuration. Notice that PVST Plus is the default mode for our switches, the 2960. Notice that the default priority number is 32768 and some of the other um, metrics and numbers. If our switch had 10 gig ports, you would see that it would have a port cost of two because the one gig ports are four and the 100 megabits are 19 and the 10 megabits are 100. We talked about port cost and you can see all the things we talked about here. The bridge ID. So the first thing to really figure out is the bridge ID and there's two ways to do it. One is to type spanning tree VLAN one root primary and that Tell switch one, I want you to be the root bridge. Method two, you can type spanning tree VLAN one priority two, four, five, seven, six, which tells switch one, I'm giving you a lower priority number than the other switches, so you'll become the root bridge. 
that's subtly different. Essentially what the first one does is switch one is going to hear the BPDUs from its neighbor switches and whatever BPDUs they set, it's going to lower its own BPDU below that to ensure it wins the election with method one. With method two, it's statically set to two, four, five, seven, six. The only problem with method two is if you have another switch set lower, it will in fact become the root bridge. The lowest bridge priority number wins. You can also set a backup root bridge. Yeah, you can have a secondary root that says, hey, if the root bridge becomes unresponsive, I'll take over. And so you could use the command spang tree vlan one root secondary to do that. Or again, method two, just set another bridge priority number that is, um, that is lower than the default. By the way, these weird numbers are because the um, bridge priority number is in multiples of 4,096. Um, 4, so um, it's probably preferred to use method one, then you don't have to really mess with those numbers. So you can just set the switch that you want to be primary or root secondary. Then you can verify by going in that switch and when you type show spanning tree, it's gonna say this bridge is the root. And you can see what priority number it's it's grabbed. And, and again, maybe you would have set that um, with method two, but either way, you can see it will have a priority number. And the lowest priority number, by the way, is one. So it's one and then 4,096 and then it goes up from there. Portfast and BPDU guard. So when you use Portfast, remember it takes the port out of spanning tree. It tells the port, you don't have to worry about these elections. You don't have to participate. You're not designated, you're not an alternate port. You're just not gonna participate. You go to forwarding immediately, just turn on. Don't mess around with this spanning tree game. And you'll get that warning that you see here in the example. So what I like to add after I've enabled the port fast, I like to type BPDU guard. And what that will do is have the port listen for BPDUs, which it should never hear because you have in devices there, PCs, printers, phones, that sort of thing. If it ever hears a BPDU, that port will shut down. And that prevents the port from accidentally getting plugged into the network where it's actually connected to another switch. In a lot of office areas, you might have several live uh, ethernet ports in the room and you can, hey, this has even happened in my lab. I've had students connect um, one www port to the internet with a cable to another www porter, uh, port to the internet on the same rack and they went to two different switches and created a loop and within 30 seconds the whole lab network went down. We have uh, we fixed that because we've added the BPDU guard on those ports but we didn't have it on our own ports uh, just a couple years back and so that's something that's better to learn to do before you have a large network outage. Let's talk about load balancing. So one thing you can do if you want here is you can set different root bridges for different parts of the network. Again, this is only for larger networks where you have maybe, um, you know, VLAN 10 is only running between switch one and switch two and uh, VLAN 20 is only running between switch three and switch two. In this case, you might wanna have different root bridges for those different um, VLANs. And you might not. You might just want to make switch to the root bridge for all VLANs since it participates in both. But in this example, they're making them separate, separate and this is the way you would do that. You can specify with the VLAN command which VLAN is the root bridge for that VLAN. And you can use method 2 for that as well. You can either use the priority root or priority root secondary command, which is method one, or you can set the actual number. Remember the multiples of 4,096, so it goes one, 4,096, and just keep adding 4,096 to 4,096. You can also do a question mark after priority and we'll list all the available numbers that are, are accepted. Okay, and here's your configuration details. Again, this is, this is showing that this bridge is the root. You can see this is the root bridge. And you can see what VLAN it is root for. For VLAN 10, it is the root bridge. 
Here's an example then of different priority numbers, different bridge priority numbers being set on the same switch for different VLANs. So here are three different VLANs, VLAN 1, 10, and 20, with three different bridge priority numbers. Spanning tree mode. There are times when you need to change the spanning tree mode. Remember that PVST Plus is the Cisco implementation of RSTP. But you might want industry standard RSTP or original STP. You can change it with the spanning tree mode command. Do a question mark at the end of mode and find out what versions your switch supports. It's important to be able to analyze the STP topology. In other words, you need to be able to figure out which switch is the root bridge, which switch is the backup root bridge, and which ports are the root ports, designated ports, those sort of things you need to know. So you can use these show commands in each switch to figure out what they're doing in regards to spanning tree. So a spanning tree can create different logical topologies than we expected, like in this example. This, this network doesn't look, look at it with those links with the, with the red, red circles Remove those with your mind, and you have a very different looking network here. So make sure that the actual topology matches what's expected. Spanning tree works very well, but it does occasionally make mistakes. Usually the mistakes are because of a configuration issue on our part. consequences of spanning tree failure. So if it moves the wrong ports to a forwarding state, any frame that is flooded by a switch enters the loop and you end up with a loop which will kill your network. It will actually cause your switches to freeze up and become unresponsive. And I should mention at this point, spanning tree works right out of the box. It's turned on. There's actually no way to turn off spanning tree in our model of switch. and you don't even have to configure it. You can just turn on three or four switches and cable them with as many cables running between the switches, plug stuff in, and Spanner Tree just figures it all out on its own, all automatically. We're teaching you how you can tune it and configure it to be more predictable, to be able to be documented and diagrammed in your network documentation, and that will assist when you have to do troubleshooting. Repairing a Spanning Tree problem. Of course, one way to correct spanning tree is to start unplugging some of those redundant cables until you have removed the loops and then start adding them back one by one and spanning tree should pick it up correctly. First hop redundancy protocol. Now this is not spanning tree. We're moving on to a brand new topic. You've so far been configuring networks that have a single gateway. A single gateway, that would be a single router. Um, that's what I have in my house. You probably have that in your house, but most companies have two, three, or four internet routers. That allows them to reach the internet if one of their providers, say they, they may have a cable provider and a DSL provider and maybe a T1, and if one of those goes down, they still will have internet. And for that to work, they're going to want to use a redundant gateway protocol. Okay. And that's the idea. The PCs don't have to know anything about it. The PCs are going to only have one gateway address. All the devices on your network are going to point to one IP address as their default gateway. But that IP address is going to be shared among the routers that are um, providing the gateway service. So if you lose a link, the PC just goes through a different path, a different router to get out there because they're all sharing the same virtual IP. So there's several protocols that will do this and these are, these are them, the different uh, protocols that, that offer that service. The simplest to understand 
is HSRP. HSRP is a standby protocol, meaning that it doesn't load balance. Only one of the routers is active and the other routers in the group are all in standby. Here they're showing only two routers. That third kind of grayed out router you see in the middle of the screen is the virtual IP address that they share. I don't know why they show it as a, as a router, but that's your virtual default gateway. That IP address is shared by both of the routers in the HSRP group, but only one of the routers in the group is actually allowed to use it. HSRP is simple um, and it's Cisco proprietary. We're going to look at VRRP soon, which is the industry standard for VRRP, and VRRP is a, a little, little nicer. HSRP verification, so you can type show standby, and it will verify that it's in group one. It will verify whether it's active or standby. In this case, it's active. You can see what the virtual IP is. That's the IP that it is using. You can see well, who who the standby routers in the group one are listed there as standby router. They would have standby router, standby router, standby router if you had three or four routers in the group. All right. So gateway load balancing protocol is another Cisco proprietary solution that improves on the previous one we looked at in that it allows load balancing. So instead of only one active gateway, why not take advantage of all those internet connections you're paying for every month, right? You've got all that bandwidth sitting there. With the um, previous example of HSRP, you only get one of those active and the others is wasted bandwidth just sitting there waiting for a failover. With GLBP, all of the routers can be active. They can all share the IP and they can basically round robin load balancing. I take a packet, you take a packet, you take a packet, I take a packet. And so they, they just kind of share the load and they all take a piece of it out there. So that's kind of a cool improvement. That's all we're going to look at in this chapter. We'll see you next week for chapter three.